Inspiration for Teachers podcast. Bringing you dynamic and inspirational educator interviews. Our fascinating guests share their professional challenges and creative resolutions for success. Discover their workable strategies, ideas, and resources to reach your educational goals. And now your host, Kelly Long. Our passionate educator on the show today is Lisa Hollenbach. Lisa is passionate about teacher voice and leadership, collaboration, innovative instruction and redefining professional development. Welcome to the show, Lisa. I've given our listeners a little snapshot about who you are, but could you delve a little deeper for us today? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Again, my name is Lisa Hollenbach and I have been teaching high school social studies um, in the United States for 14 years. I am in my third year as one of the social studies department chairs at Palmyra Area High School in Palmyra, Pennsylvania. And um, while I've taught a variety of classes in my time in Palmyra, um, I'm teaching currently 10th through 12th grade AP Psychology, Psychology, Sociology, and American Popular Culture. I have been a Keystone Technology Integrator for my district. And I am a lead teacher with our district for the Literacy Design Collaborative. Um, And that is a uh, framework that helps teachers with the Common Core College Readiness Standards um, that are popular right now in the United States. I also, in my spare time, am an instructor, an adjunct instructor with two local universities, the Lebanon Valley College, where um, I instruct pre-service teachers in methods for teaching social studies and at the Pennsylvania State University, where I teach classes on community psychology and social change and um, sociology. I am also the Palmyra Area Education um, Association president, and my most recent accomplishment is that I am co-founder and a coach for the National Blogging Collaborative, Um, and that was partially developed through my role as a uh, teacher advisory uh, council member for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Wow, Lisa, you are super busy. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you very much for introducing yourself to our listeners. We're so excited about having you on the show today, and I can't wait to delve into all of your knowledge and all the amazing advice you're going to share with us today. But at the start of the show, we'd like to get some immediate knowledge from you, some quick takeaways. What I'm going to do is place you in the center of our educational campus, Lisa, and I'm going to ask you, what is core to you in determining what's the most important thing about teaching and learning? Oh, wow. When I think about the most important thing is that learning is actually happening and that students um, and teachers, both as learners, um, can be self-directed. Um, and that they can explore the things that they're passionate about. Um, the ability to uh, make inquiries and ask tough questions um, and, and be able to take a stab at answering those questions um, without somebody telling us the way, um, but giving us the tools to get there. And could you just give us a little bit of an insight into a teacher's perspective? So we, we know that there are a lot of pressures on teachers and you know we're always working extremely hard for the benefit of our students but trying to develop yourself professionally as a teacher is always really quite difficult because sometimes there's not the coaching out there there's there's not the best uh, professional development so how would you recommend to a teacher to take control over that process so that they can get the best from their own professional development Oh, absolutely. Um, There are a lot of fantastic discussions happening right now around professional development and and really redefining um, what we do as teachers in our profession and honing our profession. Um, Teachers uh, up to this point have been relying on their districts and administrators um, and third parties to provide them with professional development. And oftentimes it's been disappointing professional development or professional development that is not directed by the teacher or um, even professional development that is useful for the teacher. So a lot of that time has been wasted and we know that uh, time is of the essence for teachers. Um, We are very time pressed. So part of professional development is being able to use your time well and to be able to um, self-direct your learning and during a time that is convenient for you. So that's what we're looking at for professional development. And we're, we're hoping that our districts and our schools start to accept some non-professional 
um, professional development as valid for teacher learning. And by non-traditional, um, what I'm talking about is collaboration, relationships and connections and networking that is happening on social media like Twitter, um, teacher blogging um, for reflection and also to share practices. Those types of things are instrumental in developing our teachers and developing their practice. And uh, we look very highly upon um, reflection for our teachers, and we, we value that, and, and blogging is one way that we do that. So um, when we reshape professional development for us, we have to be getting something that is extraordinary for the time that we're going to put into it. Um, and I would also say on the part of the teacher, um, we have a little bit of, of reshaping to do ourselves. Um, to move away from the idea that all professional development time happens within the school day or that all of it must be compensated because teachers really are taking the reins and they are uh, directing their own development in their own time, in their own way. And I think that's really exciting. Lisa, I could not agree with you more on that because I spend so much time on social media and looking at what other people are sharing and it really expands your knowledge and it really helps you to become that reflective practitioner and develop your knowledge. But also just, for example, having you on the show here today, this is one way in which you can get that professional development. Absolutely. And I, I really just had a conversation last night um, with a friend of mine who isn't very active on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I shared with her that the time that I spend on Twitter and interacting with colleagues both nationally and internationally has really changed my professional life um, greatly in the past year. And uh, I've made some promises to her to help her learn how to use it well so she can experience the same. Okay, Lisa, you've provided us with some really great value there. Thank you so much. Now we're going to flip the questions on its head a little bit, and we're going to kind of go to this yin and yang question that we have on the show, and it very much is all about what excites you right now about the teaching profession, and also what would you most like to change and why? So I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do both of those questions. So what excites you right now and what you'd most like to change? Oh, I think that what is most exciting for me right now is the growing number of teacher leaders um, who are connecting and collaborating and finding their voice and transforming their, their profession through their voice. Uh, it's really amazing how teachers are using their voices to share their knowledge, to collaborate, and really, ultimately, to help students learn across the country. Um, so that is what I'm most excited about and what most drives me as a professional. Um, and as for something I'd like to change, I look at the national narrative on education in the United States as something that is overwhelmingly negative. And I mostly attribute that to uh, the fact that a lot of people talking about education um, and, and um, spreading ideas about education are not teachers and are not intimately involved in the day to day. So I would most like to flip the script on that narrative and acknowledge the incredible things that we have happening in our schools every day. Instead, I would like to focus more on how we as teachers, uh, with our administrators, with our districts, are working tirelessly every day together to improve our schools. Um, the teachers are experts, and they have earned a place at the table to be able to have these professional discussions as respected professionals. Um, but unfortunately, in the teaching profession, uh, as you well know, isolation is, is really characteristic of what we do. We spend our times in our classrooms with the door closed. Um, and, and we don't have a lot of time to share. So I think connecting teachers to a network of colleagues and supporting them to use their voices and tell their stories is absolutely essential in developing the leadership in our teachers and also in building stronger and more successful schools. I couldn't agree with you more on that because I think that's a common problem across most cultures that education has this negativity surrounding it. And I think quite a few of my previous guests and I share a similar point of view which is when new governments come in they like to tear up what has happened before in terms of education and then they like to put their own stamp on it and we spend about two years running around trying to figure out what it is they want us to be doing and then implementing that and then before you realize it the government's been swept out and another government's coming in so I think very much taking those people that aren't really involved in education out a little bit more and bringing in the people that are involved in and giving us more control is it's really powerful and I totally agree with you but how do you encourage the teacher in the classroom to get more involved? That is difficult mostly because of the time commitment um, and I would say that each teacher has their own 
level of comfort with which they move forward with things um, like uh, professional development online or podcasts or Twitter or blogging. Um, and part of what uh, teacher leaders should be doing is providing some support and encouragement and just continuously inviting that teacher to become a part of a conversation. I find that telling my colleagues about how exciting the world of professional development is out here um, is really not enough. I think that showing them it is really what counts so that they can see what the value is, even if it's just to lurk at first, invite them to read a blog, send them a few links, um, and hopefully they will start to see the value um, that I'm getting out of what I'm doing. And I, I love to share that with colleagues, uh, anyone who will spend some time listening to me go on and on about how much I'm learning. And I think that over time, when they start to see the value of what they could possibly gain as a professional from using all of these resources, they do come around and at their own pace, uh, will start to contribute to that national narrative on education. We share a common ground on that one, Lisa. Now what we're going to do is move on to your professional challenge and the reason why you're on the show with us today. Could you paint that picture for us in the minds of our listeners, please, Lisa? Uh, right now in our field of education, there is a very myopic vision of, of what the role of the teacher is. And teachers, as we see it, would really like to be leaders, but that's not necessarily in the capacity of an administrator um, or a guidance counselor, and we have been limited in how we can grow up to this point um, in those roles. So a teacher either stays in the classroom, they either become an administrator or a guidance counselor, or they leave the profession when it's time to grow. And we know that we have fantastic teachers here, and we want to keep them in our classrooms. So my thoughts are our problems are largely uh, based around this um, lack of a career ladder for teachers. We need something that's a little bit more differentiated that opens up new possibilities for the tremendous talent that we have in our classrooms to lead as uh, coaches or as uh, lead teachers for their peers, but also keeping them grounded and connected in their classroom and, and very reflective practitioners so that they could be relevant uh, to the people that they're trying to coach and help. So um, I know that there are some states within the U.S. that are exploring uh, more expanded career ladders and hybrid roles for teachers, so they're part in the classroom and part outside of the classroom, and some states are doing so very successfully. Uh, but other states haven't even looked at this possibility yet. So we can look at all of those successful examples and make this more the norm in education across the entire country. Do you have any ideas about how we could develop a career path to allow a teacher to remain in the classroom? Uh, I believe that we have to think a little bit outside of the box about um, about what a teacher is. And there is a lot of there are a lot of um, traditions and rules right now that are standing in our way uh, of that revolve around teachers evaluating their peers. Um, but honestly, I believe that uh, that there's no one better um, to offer support and advice to a teacher than a master teacher. Um, you know, that is still that is still grounded in the classroom and, and that is really um, helpful, constructive feedback to make that classroom better for the kids that are learning in it. Um, I think we have to just look at the role of teacher as different and differentiate and distribute the power and the leadership across the entire spectrum in a school. Uh, so we have the people who are truly um, have their hands in the work and getting their hands dirty, making some of the decisions about what happens in that school. And, and that really is a, a philosophical change and it's an entire mindset change. So I, I know that it's going to take some time to get to that place, uh, but I look forward to a time when that does happen. It is really challenging, isn't it, when you're a teacher and it, I think it's quite easy to forget how hard it is being a teacher in a classroom once you start moving up the career ladder and then going into those leadership roles. It's quite easy to forget how difficult it is. But I was talking to another guest, Jason Borton, in episode three of his podcast, and he was saying that he dedicates two days of his week, and he is a principal of a school, to teaching so that he remains on the same um, par as his teachers. He understands their problems. He can lead the way by showing everybody else that he's doing the same. And I think that's a really inspiring way of approaching how to develop teachers, how to get them involved in, in leadership, but not necessarily by promoting them or moving them sideways out of the role. What do you think about that, Lisa? Oh, I think that that is absolutely fabulous. And one thing that I would like to see, and I know that administrators are just as time pressed as, as teachers are, 
with all of the expectations of, of uh, running a building. But I would absolutely love to see administrators blogging more and, and maybe even co-blogging with their teachers. Um, I've spoken to some fantastic administrators over the past few months um, who really do have that mindset where they are the lead learners in their districts and they are giving their teachers these fantastic spaces to grow and develop and be creative and are encouraging that. And some principals who are even at the point where they may be moving into higher levels of administration in the districts, but really feel that it's important to stay grounded in, in the work, in the teaching work. And I, I really believe that is something that's admirable about these leaders because they understand that in order to be um, in a place where they can make the best decisions for kids and for teachers, they need to remember they need to remember what it is to be a teacher and be in the classroom with those students. So when I find an administrator who recognizes that, I, I am really in awe of them, and I, I feel that I'm so fortunate uh, to work with them because because they are the ones that I think really get it. So we're about to hit our inspiration round, but before we do, I just want to remind our listeners that they can find all of your resources on our podcast page. So they just need to head over to inspirationforteachers.com and they can find all of the show notes and all of your top tips from today's episode. So now moving on to our inspiration rounds, Lisa, it's your opportunity to provide our listeners with the best educational resources that you know of to support them. Let's start with our first question. So can you share with us your proudest educational moment, please? Uh, My proudest moment in education is actually quite recent. Uh, Without a doubt, I would say it was being part of an extraordinary team of teacher leaders who founded the National Blogging Collaborative. Um, This was an incredibly passionate and organic collaboration that enabled a group of us to turn our passion into an action. So Here, educators can learn, they can be elevated, they can be celebrated, but uh, we believe that what really matters is what you do once you are empowered. Um, And it's really important that we give back to the profession that gives so much to us and create opportunities for others to learn and to grow. And that's what we hope that we can do in the educational environment with National Blogging Collaborative. And I think that blogging for teachers is getting greater and bigger and and it's really kind of empowering a teacher to talk about what's going on in their classroom and to share some good practice, but also to kind of reinforce some confidence because we do do a very challenging job and we do come up against some tough um, situations and sometimes we don't always know how to work our way through a scenario. But what I'd be really interested to find out from you, Lisa, is There are so many different blogs out there that people can choose to read. How can you help somebody to develop their blog, get the reflective learning going on within that blog, but also allow them to get some feedback from other educators about their blog? We have a system set up pretty well with the National Blogging Collaborative to do just that. Um, Some teachers come to us already established with a a space where they are blogging and where they are doing their work. Other teachers are coming to us fresh from the starting gate and they are not, they don't even have a space uh, to blog at that point. And we give a couple options. Um, We will certainly help teachers to find the, the blog space that is best for them. And, and help them to set up that blog. And so we do, um, we do give assistance with something, you know, that basic where it comes to blogging just to help you find your best space that, that is a good fit for you. Um, but we also have a blog space, um, that we host on the site, uh, through Medium. And, um, we certainly would host anybody's blogs, uh, anyone's blogs on there as well. Um, a full blog or maybe just a link to their own. So um, that's one way that um, we help teachers get established with uh, with a blog space. Um, but part of what we do is also to tweet and use social media to help the teacher push their blog out to different professional learning networks. And um, between all of the coaches that we have at the National Blogging Collaborative, uh, it, it does have a, a pretty wide reach. So not only are we encouraging the teachers who are blogging to tweet to their followers, but we are tweeting um, to all of ours as coaches and suggesting those blogs to people who might be interested in them. 
And um, we do believe that feedback is very important because it does uh, create, I mean, we are giving the teachers feedback on their writing, but we also would like some comments on the blogs, right? So um, a blog, you know, commenting on a blog is really opening up a very rich conversation and an opportunity to learn from one another. Um, so what we're hoping is that by pushing um, the blog out through social media and directing it to the people who might be interested in it will help one of those conversations open up around the subject matter of the writing. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. So now we're going to move on to the best advice you have ever received. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> when we talk about the best advice, and it, especially where, with regard to writing, um, I would say that I've always written, right, because everybody writes as they go through their education, but I've not always been comfortable defining myself as a writer. So I, when I started to feel the need to share a lot of my ideas through writing, I had a very wise friend um, who gave me a little advice. And one of my colleagues reminded me that my writing, first of all, doesn't have to be perfect because nobody's perfect. And that maybe I should not focus so much on writing to share ideas because that's only one reason that we write. Um, but that writing also helps us to learn and to uncover the things that we don't yet know. So really, we use it as a vehicle to our own self-discovery. And, and writing is, is akin to thinking. It's reflecting. Um, so, so really, um, what he told me was to lean into that discomfort and to take risks and to learn to trust myself. And I really have found that to be liberating, not only in my writing, but in everything that I do. That's a bit like what Carol Dweck says about having a growth mindset. It's really kind of pushing yourself into those uncomfortable scenarios of learning, which we ask our pupils to do all of the time <laughs> and open up your mind and really experience the learning that's going on there. Absolutely. And I think that when we, um, when we are writing, oftentimes we reveal things um, about ourselves and we learn things about ourselves that we didn't know before. It can be a very charged and emotional process um, to write about the things that we're most passionate about. Um, and I think we walk away from the experience with a greater understanding of our practice and also a greater understanding of ourselves. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Lisa. What we're going to do now is move on to your personal sources of inspiration. I think that my personal sources of inspiration um, is really, uh, I can attribute that to um, the work that I've done to surround myself with a very amazing professional learning network um, over the past year, and both in person and through some through amazing professional opportunities, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Teacher Advisory Council, and also the Elevating and Celebrating Effective Teachers and Teaching Convenings. Um, but also through social media and specifically through Twitter. Um, my colleagues who have really become my friends and my family across the country and in my district are just a constant source of inspiration and support and encouragement. And I'm just so fortunate to have them in my corner. Um, and certainly, Kelly, my students inspire me to learn and to do more and be more so that I can bring my very best to the classroom every day because they deserve nothing less. That's so true. Can I just take you back to the Bill and Melinda Gates Teachers Advisory Council? What is it that you do there? The Teachers Advisory Council is a group of teachers from across the, the United States um, that serve in an advisory capacity to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and what we do is we engage in a conversation with the foundation and their program officers um, about their efforts and initiatives in the field of education. We are able to give them very candid um, opinions uh, from the the field uh, about whether or not what they're thinking works um, and our advice to them as they move forward in affecting educational policies. So, um, you know, they count on us uh, to to talk with them about the realities of education in the United States so that they could make make some of the best uh, decisions about what they will do to affect policy. That's really awesome. <laughs> Very fortunate to be a part of that group. Oh, yeah, definitely. Have you met them? I have actually not not met um, Bill Gates. Um, Melinda Gates did speak before the Teachers Advisory Council in December. Um, so that was a very exciting opportunity to um, to have her come and speak to our group. And, um, you know, I also feel very fortunate that she took the time to come and speak with us. Um, and, you know, we always hope that that um, someday we will be able to meet them before we're finished with our time in the advisory council. 
Wow, that's so powerful. How exciting. It is very exciting. So let's go to a personal teaching or educational habit that works for you time and again that you think somebody else could implement into their daily teaching. Well, Kelly, I would say from from my perspective, something that works time and time again in my classroom is that I really have a desire to make my content engaging and relevant and fun for my students. And, I, and I, in, in full disclosure, I'll tell you that that's not hard to do in social sciences like psychology and sociology. Um, there's so much fun that I can have in those subjects. Um, but I have a passion for connecting the concepts we learn to students' real life, um, to technology, and especially to popular culture. So it makes a more meaningful connection to the students. Um, you know, and I find that they learn when they make those connections with their own lives and viewing learning through their own lenses. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing in particular that I do is in my psychology classes, I ask my students to look around their lives and in their worlds and find examples of psychology and find examples of the concepts that we talk about in the classroom. And they actually use Twitter with me and uh, send their, um, their examples. We call them psych immersions. So they send me tweets, hashtag psych immersion, when they find psychology on their television shows or in their neighborhoods or in their families. And you would be surprised at how often I receive psych immersions from my kids on the weekends or, you know, in the evenings where they are really seeing the content come to life somewhere in the real world. And I think that that is really impactful for them. And it, in, it's something that they take with them out of the classroom for years to come. That really is active learning outside of the classroom. And I think sometimes we really need to extend that conversation that's going on in the classroom and take it outside so they can see it. But that's really interesting what you're doing. But I was just I can just hear lots of teachers in my head going, ah, oh, that's quite scary getting <laughs> children to tweet to you what's going on. You know, we have very much over here in the UK a lot of the internet safety policies mm -hmm. going on and there's, there's lots of concern about how children use social media so how did you set those parameters of guidance to keep you safe from a teaching point of view but also keep your students safe right there are, there are many different um, ways that you can approach and teachers um, that are using social media in the United States are approaching it in very different ways um, in my case I use one Twitter for my personal professional interactions and I have an entirely separate account that I use to interact with my students some teachers actually use parental permission slips and will have te have students create a, a new Twitter account that is used solely for the classroom um, so even more so than just having an individual teacher account, that sets the students up um, with an account that has no demographic identifiers, so it's not their name or their picture that is out there in the world, and they're solely using that account to interact with their teacher um, in a way that is social. Uh, and there are some fantastic things happening here uh, with the teachers, teachers who are very active on Twitter and using that in part of their classroom practice. So it, it, it's always good to be safe when we're talking about social media with our students. Um, but I think that sometimes when we think about safety, we go too far to the other end and, and we're irrationally afraid of, of what can happen. So if we are smart about how we use it, uh, I think it's a very powerful tool for us to interact with our students and use it as a form of taking the learning outside of the classroom, making it more relevant to the students, playing with the students on their own field, um, in, in using the technology that they're most familiar with, and, and harnessing the power of social media to help us as teachers. And it gives them the autonomy to develop their learning and to you know, experience it outside of the classroom and take it and develop it further. So I, I really like that concept. I might try it in my own classroom. <laughs> oh, very good. And You know, when we talk about blogging as well, um, we can blog with our students in classrooms and many teachers are doing that as well. And we talk with our students a lot about audience and, and writing appropriately for their audience. So sometimes we even um, have hashtags for our classes. We have students sharing their writing out there in the world. And uh, my students find it absolutely mind blowing when they look at their analytics on their blog page and find that people from you know, the UK or people from Japan or somebody from South America has hopped into their site and read something that they have written about their class. Um, that, that's really, um, that, that's really powerful 
for students to get that kind of authentic feedback from other people that are not just their teacher. Uh, so spreading that through social media is, is a really powerful way to show our students how we can learn together. And I always find that there's a three-way relationship when it comes to learning. So there's the teacher, the pupil, the parent or the guardian. Have you found any additional engagement from the parent or the guardian's point of view when you're using Twitter and social media and blogging to help engage the parent with the child's learning? I will say that when I am um, reading through the blogs of my students, I will often take the time to send a message to a parent, and I do invite them to follow along on Twitter. I'm, I'm not certain how many of them do, um, but some teachers do open that up for parents to follow along with the conversations that we're having about our classwork on Twitter. And um, I will invite the parents oftentimes into the blog space and, and tell them that their kids are doing remarkable work and they should really see um, the, the kind of profound ideas that their kids are coming up with. And I, I have already, um, you know, sent those links out to parents and said, please take a look at this because this is fabulous work. So um, parents like to see that and they like to see how their kids are using social media, um, websites and those type of things in a way that's giving them a positive digital footprint instead of um, using it in ways that uh, a lot of people fear that teenagers will use it. So this is some way that they could use it in a way that improves their education and, in, and improves the experience that they're having with technology. It's such a creative time for student engagement. It just It's just phenomenal. I just blows my mind all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's so much that we can do every day with what we have at our disposal. And um, I really admire the teachers who are stepping outside of that box and, and uh, raising the bar for their kids to really create and make their own learning experiences. So, Lisa, do you have a resource now that you could share with our listeners that you think would add some value to what's going on in their classroom? Absolutely. Um, I, I will share with you first um, nationalbloggingcollaborative.com. So it's www.nationalbloggingcollaborative.com. And the National Blogging Collaborative is a free service that was created for teachers by teachers in an effort to encourage more educators to really contribute their voices to that national education narrative we've been speaking of. And what we hope is that we've fashioned a venue to support and encourage teachers to write, uh, write with each other, write independently on topics of professional importance uh, or even of personal interest. And what we hope is that we cultivate and support the capacity of all teachers to use their unique voice to elevate their craft and, and to elevate their learning in a unique and individualized way with our protocols and through our one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we are... Um, really excited about what's happening at the National Blogging Collaborative and um, are, are available any time to help any teacher um, who needs um, a little bit of support in their writing and to get their voice out into the world. It sounded as though you had a second one. Was this... Absolutely. I will, I will share two other websites with you um, that I think are, are, are very important websites for uh, teachers where they can get a lot of great information. Uh, the first one is www.ldc.org, um, and that will take you to the Literacy Design Collaborative. And this is also a, a partner of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the Literacy Design Collaborative is a... Um, a fabulous, fabulous group that provides resources for literacy instruction. Um, they have a website called Core Tools where a teacher can get in and they can browse um, modules that have been designed by teachers and vetted um, as exemplary practice um, and, and use them in their classrooms. And they can also contribute uh, to, that, um, to that collection of work and be juried as, uh, as module writers and become a part of that conversation. Finally, I would offer you a website uh, called Teaching Channel. It's www.teachingchannel.org. Um, this is a, another group that partners with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what the Teaching Channel does is actually provides us with videos and sometimes lesson plans of best practices and exemplary teachers um, who are doing great work across all of the subjects um, in many different fields and grade levels um, as a place for teachers to come together to break that isolation that we've talked about, to be able to have a window into other teachers' classrooms and see how they practice and hear the teacher discuss and break that down. 
Um, so that is a place where um, teachers can find videos that are of interest to them to improve their practice and use that as a, a fantastic source of professional development. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us, Lisa. It's really valuable, and I'm definitely going to check those out. Great, great. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Lisa. I've really, really appreciated your insights, your knowledge, and all the wisdom that you shared with us today. So thank you so much from me. Oh, absolutely, Kelly. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to um, be on the show and, and speak with your listeners. Before we say goodbye, please could you share with our listeners how they can contact you? Absolutely. Um, you can find me on Twitter, um, and there you will also find my blog page, which is uh, medium.com at Lisa Hollenbach, or you can find me at the National Blogging Collaborative.com. Thank you for joining us today on Inspiration for Teachers. For more resources, tips, and advice, visit our website, inspirationforteachers.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would love to connect with you. Just click like on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash inspirationforteachers. 